Yes. Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this industry day um, that we're arranging to talk about the, um, the import border controls that the UK is going to be bringing in next year. My name is Tom Smith. I'm a director in the Border and Protocol Delivery Group. We're part of the UK Cabinet Office, which is the central government ministry. Um, you'll be hearing a bit more from me in a minute, but first I'm really pleased to introduce my minister, Right Honourable Michael Ellis, QCMP, who will say a few words to you this morning, Minister. Well, thank you very much indeed, Tom, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this industry day for the uh, Central Europe region. And uh, as Tom was saying, I'm Michael Ellis. I'm uh, the Paymaster General here at the Cabinet Office, and uh, that means that I'm the Minister in Her Majesty's Government who is responsible for ensuring a smooth transition to the new trading arrangements between the United Kingdom uh, and the European Union. Uh, that includes, of course, the implementation of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. So I wanted to join the thanks um, uh, today for to all of you for, for joining us. And I am particularly pleased that so many of you are interested in taking the time to talk about trade with the United Kingdom. Um, I can tell you this, that Her Majesty's Government, we're totally committed to, uh, to building on and developing our trading relationship with the European Union. Uh, we have an excellent trade and cooperation agreement, uh, which provides for tariff-free trade. And of course, there are still some issues. Uh, there's bound to be the grinding of some gears, uh, and we are resolving those. But we're working really hard with the European Union authorities to resolve them, and uh, we hope that uh, they, of course, will respond uh, in the same spirit. Uh, it is important to emphasise that the continued value uh, and variety of trade between us demonstrates very clearly the closeness of our relationship. Uh, it is a relationship of equals, uh, a relationship of friends and a relationship of neighbours. And the purpose of today's important event uh, is really to talk about what happens next year in 2022. Now that we're no longer uh, inside the single market and the customs union, there will be bound to be different procedures for selling goods to the United Kingdom. Uh, we have been careful to introduce these uh, procedures uh, gradually. And we have also pushed the timetable back, as many of you will have noticed, because of the unprecedented impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has disrupted business both here in the United Kingdom, but of course throughout the European Union and indeed uh, throughout the world. These procedures um, will now come into force over the next year. And we have therefore brought together today uh, the full range of experts who can talk about these procedural changes and how you uh, need to prepare for them. We're also going to talk today uh, about our longer term plans for modernising the UK border uh, with the development of uh, a single trade window. You'll hear more about that uh, later on. So please do take full advantage of the cast of experts that are going to be on this call that we've brought together today. And do ask questions um, if you need more clarity or more information. Please also, and this is really important, ladies and gentlemen, share with us today and share what you hear today with your customers and through your supply chains. We've placed a comprehensive set of information also on our website. It's worth looking at that at www.gov.uk uh, and please use that website as a resource. Um, it, uh, it'll help you get in touch um, with any follow up questions that you might have. Now, let me just emphasize again in conclusion, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we, we are very much open for business with the European Union. We want to be clear with you 
uh, what you will need to do going forward, and we want to help you get it right. Uh, we want to ensure that the trade between us uh, can continue to flow, and uh, that's what today is all about. So thank you once again, everyone, for, for joining us today. I'm now going to hand back over to Tom Smith from the Border and Protocol Delivery Group. Tom. Thank you very much, Minister. OK, so let's just say a bit more about um, what we're going to be doing this morning. Firstly, let me just um, introduce the Border and Protocol Delivery Group and say a bit about what we do. We were established in 2017 to bring forward the work, bring together the work of government working with border industry to deliver, develop a workable operating model for when the UK, UK leaves the European Union. We work very closely with border industry as well as with business more generally to ensure that the practical concerns of business are understood by the people who are making policy in government and to make sure that, that business views are reflected in what we do. So we're very much looking forward to hearing your questions in today's session because we do listen very closely and we do feed those views upwards so that they can be addressed. Particularly delighted to be talking today at this event for the Central Europe region because trade with this region is so important to the UK. Before COVID-19, trade within, between the UK and Central Europe, so Poland, Austria, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria and Croatia was at record levels. In 2019, it was worth more than 63 billion a year, 65% rise compared with 2010. We want to keep building on this and we want to ensure that trade between the regions continues to rise. We'll be, doing, we'll be hearing more from our varied speakers today about import controls. Um, we, have a, we have a particular step-by-step -step case study showing the movement of auto parts from the EU to Great Britain. Obviously, trade between us is not just respect, restricted to automotive and machinery sectors. As an example, in 2019, nearly £2 billion worth of food and live animals were imported into Great Britain from Poland alone. And I'm very grateful for colleagues from the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs who have joined us today to talk in particular about what our requirements will be in terms of sanitary and phytosanitary checks. And I'd like to encourage you to use the session to ask any questions that you have. So please take full advantage of this session today. Please do use the, the question and answer function once we've got the government experts on the line here. Um, thank you to you all for coming. Thank you to my colleagues for joining us. And I will now hand over to my colleague, Natasha Draycott, who will take you through the remainder of this event. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. As you can see from the slide, sorry, just having some issues with sound. Thank you. Um, my name is Natasha Draycott and I also work for the Border and Protocol Delivery Group and I work for the Border Industry Engagement and Business Readiness team here. Um, so I appreciate that you'll all be keen to get to the detail of today's event and I will be handing over shortly to my colleagues from HMRC and DEFRA to run you through that detail. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to go through a couple of slides before we start the event. So on the next slide, we do have a, a few ground rules there is what we've called them. Um, basically, just to say, please do keep asking your questions throughout this event using the Q&A function. Um, we've got lots of colleagues online available to answer your questions. Um, so they will be answering as we go along and we'll also have a Q&A session at the end of the event as well. So please, please do use that function in today's event. Um, also, just to, to say that after the event, we will be sending a copy of the slides to everyone who has registered today. We'll also be uploading a recording of the event to gov.uk and we'll also share a Q&A document in the coming weeks. So if we go to the next slide, 
here's a copy of the agenda for today. So this is displayed in UK time, but it does give you a feel for who will be presenting today. Um, so we're going to have presentations from UK government departments, including HMRC, DEFRA and BAYS. Um, and then we will move into a case study section followed by Q&A. So if we go to the next slide, we do have a, a quick ask of you before we get into the detail of today's event. Um, so we have a few readiness polls throughout the event and we would like you to fill these in on Slido, please. Um, so I've just pasted the link in the, um, in the Q&A. So if you can follow that link or use your smartphone to, to follow the QR code, or if you go on to Slido and type in the hashtag BPDG, all those uh, manners of accessing the polls will get you to our survey today. So if we go to the next slide, this is the first question that we have today, which is, have you moved goods between the EU and GP? since the 1st of January 2021 and you'll see that there are four different options there for you to choose from. So I'll just give you a minute to fill that in and whilst you're looking at that if we go to the next slide this is a summary slide which shows the key dates for import controls next year. Um, I won't go through this slide in detail because our presenters will be will be talking through these dates later. Um, but just to say that when we do send the slides around to you later, this is a really useful summary slide. So then if we go on to the next slide, please. So before I hand over, we do just have one more question on Slido which is which of the following statements best applies to you or your business? And this sort of assesses your knowledge at the start of this event. So hopefully if you are unsure about any of the procedures, um, this event will um, be helpful to you to understand more. So I will now hand over to my colleague Claire from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs um, to talk through the details of customs procedures. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Tasha. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so as Tasha says, I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the customs processes uh, that will be required from the 1st of January. That you're online. Hi, Tasha, can you hear me? Hi, Claire, yeah, if you, can, if you carry on. <laughs> You can. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. Kathleen, if you could move to the next slide. So here's an overview um, of the current position and the, the look ahead towards the 1st of January 2022. Uh, since the 1st of January 2021, there has been an ability to make a delayed declaration. So that's for both UK and EU traders. This process allows importers of non-controlled goods from the EU to make an entry into their own records and follow that with a supplementary declaration up to 175 days after the date of that import. And at that point of the supplementary declaration, either the, uh, the importer, the UK importer, um, or an agent must be authorised for supplementary declaration processes. A recent change on the 1st of October is that exit summary declarations, also known as safety and security declarations, are required on all exports from GB to EU that are not covered by a full export declaration. We did have a waiver in place on empty pallets, containers and roll on roll off uh, transport, but that has ended since the 30th of September. And you can find out more information about EXS declarations on gov.uk and we do come on to that in a little bit more detail. But looking ahead from the 1st of January 2022, importers or their agent and if you are an EU trader not established in the UK, you will need to use a UK established agent. You will need to be approved to use any simplified procedures such as that entry into declarants records followed by a supplementary declaration at the point of import. And from the 1st of July 2022, entry summary declarations will be required on all imports moving from, uh, from GB to EU. 
Next slide, please, Kathleen. So let's talk a little bit about those entry summary declarations in more detail. There is currently a waiver in place for goods being imported, but as I've said, from the 1st of July 2022, a full declaration will be required. Those declarations are required at consignment level, and it is the carriers who have the responsibility to ensure the ENS is submitted, although a third party may lodge the declaration with the carrier's consent. And those safety and security declarations must be submitted before the goods arrive in Great Britain. The time required to do that is dependent on the route chosen and the mode of transport. If you move on to the next slide, please, Kathleen. And how to actually make those declarations. So there is a system uh, access that is required, but first you will need a GB EORI number. And just a quick recap on GB EORI numbers. They are available. Uh, they are usually uh, handed out within 10 uh, minutes online. They're really, really quick, but it is a gov.gateway access required to get that. And you can find out more information on gov.uk about GB EORIs. You do not need to be established in the UK in order to get a GB EORI. So if you're needing to make ENS declarations, you will require some system accesses. You will need to access the safety and security GB service. So you will need to register for that. Again, that's through the government gateway. And once registered, you can use a compatible software or the services of a community service system provider, sorry, in order to submit those declarations. And we've provided a link and as Natasha said, you will be receiving a set of these slides and those links will be live to use within those slides. If you could move us on again one slide, please, Kathleen. And I mentioned uh, safety and security uh, exit summary declarations. So they have been required from the 1st of January, but there was that waiver in place for empty pallets, containers and modes of transport being moved under a transport contract and on all roll on roll off movements of goods. But that has now ceased. In many cases, safety and security requirements for exports are met using a customs export declaration. And there are more information on gov.uk about when you will need to provide an exit summary declaration. And the declarations themselves are made through the HMRC chief system rather than safety and security GB, which is for entry summary declarations only. If you can move us on again, please, Kathleen. Let's talk a little bit now about the models that you will encounter at uh, UK ports. So border locations receiving goods moving uh, into GB from the EU will be choosing now between two models for customs control. There is a model called temporary storage model, allowing goods to be stored for up to 90 days at an approved storage facility. This is a model that was already in place. And there's a new model called a pre-lodgement model, uh, which uh, uh, requires goods to be declared before they board at the EU side. And you can find out a list of border locations that will be using the goods vehicle movement service to support that pre-lodgement at gov.uk. Again, there's another link. I apologise, there are a lot of links, but they're very useful. And we'll be talking a little bit more about the goods vehicle movement service in a short while. If you can move us on again, please, Kathleen. So just to talk a little bit about temporary storage, that's one of those models. Goods imported from the EU can be stored temporarily under customs control before they are released to free circulation, are re-exported or placed under the outward processing procedure or placed under any special procedures. From the 1st of January 2022, an inventory system will be required for all temporary storage facilities including those storing non-EU goods. If you can move us on another slide, we'll talk a little bit more about pre-lodgement. And this is where the goods vehicle movement service is being introduced because it will support locations where pre-lodgement is required from the 1st of January 2022. And the ports that will be adopting GVMS will be ports where they don't have room for that temporary storage facility, for example. So as I said, you can find a list of ports that are adopting GVMS. That list is live now and will be continued to be updated as ports 
continue to uh, develop their models. So the Goods Vehicle Movement Service has been live for goods moving under transit into GB since the 1st of January 2021, but it will be used for both imports and exports, including those under transit from the 1st of January 2022. GVMS allows the link of multiple references into one single goods movement reference at the frontier. So that means that the haulier at the EU port before embarking on the journey will present a single goods movement reference to the carrier and that will be validated before they onboard. It also allows for the automation of Office of Transit function, marking the entry of goods into GB Customs Territory. That one's been live since the 1st of January. If you could move us on another slide, please, Kathleen. So just to recap on the fact that GVMS is currently live for transit movements. So goods moving under transit between EU and GB from the 1st of January 2021, a transit MRN has been required and entered into, into GVMS to create a goods movement reference. But from the 1st of January 2022, export and import declarations under transit will be using that process. And if you can move us on again, please, Kathleen. So Goods Vehicle Movement Service is a new system. In order to use GVMS, both UK and EU hauliers will need to register um, and they will need to do that on a government gateway account. To get that, they also need a GB Yori. And as I just mentioned earlier, that is available for both UK and non-UK established businesses. And in order to access GVMS, you can register this register for the service now um, and get used to the service requirements. There are additional software requirements and we've noted those here. If you move us on again, please, Kathleen. And here's a customer journey. The GVMS import route from EU to GB. So before moving the goods, uh, the uh, haulier or the logistics firm will apply for and receive a GB Yori number, register for GVMS. You can create a GMR, that's the goods movement reference number, up to 28 days before the movement of the goods. And then before arriving at the EU place of exit, the haulier will, re will use that GMR and upload any additional information such as vehicle, trailer reference and additional uh, goods movement reference numbers and then that will be validated by the carrier at the point of embarkation. And as you can see when you're crossing, during the crossing, the, uh, the haulier will check the system to make sure that the GMR has been uh, either validated for goods to move straight on or for the goods to be sent for a check. And you'll see there at the traffic light symbol that will allow the the haulier to uh, identify what their journey route is at disembarkation. And the, once the goods are cleared, uh, that automatic message is sent back to the importer who made the declaration on chief as well. So that just shows you how it all links together and what the journey will be like. If you could move us on again, please, Kathleen. Let's talk a little bit now about common transit convention movements. So the UK acceded to the convention in its own right. And as you may know, the Common Transit Convention allows suspension of customs checks and payments of duties until the goods reach their final destination. Now under CTC, there are three distinct customs functions, Office of Departure, Office of Transit and Office of Destination. And many of those Office of Departure and Destination functions can be completed at a customs office or if you're an authorised consign or consignee, they can be completed at your place of business. If you move us on again, please, Kathleen. We've got some common errors here that we have been seeing during 2021, although we are noticing that the errors are dramatically reducing as people get used to moving goods through transit. But it's worth noting here that hauliers not ending movements at office of destination or authorised consignee locations will mean that the guarantee is not released and that can cause problems for your overall guarantee levels. 
It's also been noticed that Holy is not completing an Office of Transit on entry into GB can again it, uh, cause problems as it is not legally compliant. You must not present the GB URI, but you must present the correct information. If you move us on again, please, Kathleen. Here are some further transit errors to avoid. Some transit movements are being closed before the goods leave the EU. So UK consignees are closing movements on the national com uh, computerised transit system before they receive the goods. Again, this is not legally compliant and is causing some movements to close before the goods enter the UK. There have also been noticed that there are inconsistencies between goods, transit declarations and import declarations. It's very important that your paperwork is correct. There should not be any discrepancies or errors. Next slide, please, Kathleen. And two more transit common errors. Declaring the wrong office of departure. Some non-simplified traders, so that's those who are not authorised consignors, are declaring an office of departure on their transit declaration, which is different to the office where the transit movement is actually being started. And if you're not an authorised consignor, that must be the port of exit or the nearest official office of departure to their premises. And finally, declaring the wrong office of transit for entry into the EU or other CTC territory. <coughs> Upon me, some traders are not entering the correct office of transit on their declaration. And again, that can cause significant delays at the border for the driver. So those are the six common transit errors um, and hopefully that will help you avoid them. Next slide, please, Kathleen. I'm going to talk a little bit about GB import VAT. So postponed VAT accounting is available to all VAT registered businesses for imports of goods from all countries. So that's EU and rest of world goods being moved into GB. Postponed VAT accounting allows businesses to account for import VAT on their VAT return rather than at the point of import or the point of customs declaration. So this allows a cash flow benefit. UK VAT registered traders who are currently using delayed declarations during 2021 must use postponed VAT accounting. But if you're not VAT registered or you're not using delayed declarations, it is an optional. And just to say that if you're a non-established taxable person, you are also entitled to use PVA. In order to import goods into the UK, a non-established taxable person will need to hold that GB EORI and instruct an agent to make the customs declaration on its behalf. Next slide, please, Kathleen. And just a quick run through on empty and returnable packaging. So from the 1st of January 2021, reusable packaging would require an import or export declaration. But if you're claiming return goods relief or temporary admission, you can make this declaration by conduct or orally. So for imports, on import, the packaging can be declared for free circulation by conduct or orally to a border force officer. These goods can also be declared for temporary admission if they are intended to be re-exported. And for exports, if you're declaring exports of reusable packaging by conduct, you will not need to make them available for examination unless Border Force stop you. And there is a lot of information on gov.uk about reusable packaging. Next slide, please, Kathleen. And rules of origin is worth talking about. So this, again, is something that's new under the UK EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Traders will need to learn how to classify their goods, look up the origin rules and check those goods meet those rules. They'll also need to sort out supply chain documentation. And during 2021, there has been an easement that allowed um, a statement of origin to be made without suppliers declarations in place, although the information should have been um, available at all times. But from the 1st of January, a supplier declaration will need to be in place as you are making that statement of origin. And that's if a supplier declaration is required. And again, there's lots of information on gov.uk. And just a quick reference on the difference between EU and UK exporter reference number. 
In the EU, the exporter reference number will be the exporter's registered exporter number, also known as REX number, and these are needed if exporters' consignments have a total value of more than €6,000. But in the UK, we do not use registered exporter numbers. Instead, the, the exporter reference number will be that EORI number, so it will be their GB EORI number. Next slide, please, Kathleen. And here's just a final recap on the customs uh, processes that you will need to prepare for for January 1st, 2022. We recommend that you agree in core terms and be really clear about who is responsible for what within the movement. Share any detail within the supply chain so that your whole supply chain is robust. Apply for any authorizations now. So that might be for GVMS or simplify procedures. And if you are applying for simplified procedures, then bear in mind that you will need um, uh, those to be in place and it does take up to 60 days for those authorizations to be approved. And remember, exit summary declarations are required now for all movements between GB EU if they are not covered within the customs declaration. And then looking ahead to the 1st of January 2022, you will need to submit import declarations for EU to GB movements. And as we've noted, the goods vehicle movement service is required. And you, if you're a haulier, please do register now for GVMS and get used to the process. And then even further ahead, let's look to sunny days in July 2022. And the change there will be that entry summary declarations will be required from that date, but a waiver will be in place until the 1st of July. And I think I've come to the end of the custom slides, so I'll hand back to Natasha. Thank you, Claire. So just to say as well, I can see that people are putting questions in the chat. There's been a few questions about GVMS and I can see that HMRC colleagues are answering those. Um, we will also have a plenary Q&A session at the end, so please keep asking your questions. Um, also, just before I hand over to my colleague from uh, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, um, there's also been a question about whether we can send out the slides. Um, yes, so we will be sending the slides out this afternoon, um, so you can click through and look at all the links that Claire was referencing in her presentation. Um, so I will now hand over to Nadia Manan from the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Nadia, are you ready to go? Yes, thank you, Tasha. Uh, can you hear me OK? We can, yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Nadia Manan and I work in the Department of Environmental, Food and Rural Affairs in the UK. Um, I'm going to be talking you through the new import controls for sanitary and phytosanitary goods entering Great Britain following the announcement that was made by UK government on 14th September. Uh, my colleagues are joining for the Q&A, so please do put any questions into the chat and they'll get, do their best to answer these. Um, if we can move forward to the next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so some changes were introduced in January 2021 and already apply to certain goods. This includes products of animal origin under safeguard measures, live animals and high priority plants and plant products. There are links to further guidance on this page if you need a refresher on these controls. If you can move on to the next slide, please, um, and I can talk you through the changes to import controls. So, how, <clears throat> so I'll now give you a brief overview of future import controls which will come into force next year before talking in more detail about IT systems, health certification and marketing standards. From 1st, July, 1st January 2022, products of animal origin, animal byproducts and high risk food not of animal origin will need to be pre-notified. Pre-notification for all regulated plants and plant products will also be required. Notification should be made by your importer in Great Britain using the import of animals, food and feed system or IPATH, which is a new IT system for notifying the authorities in Great Britain. 
from July 2022, there will be new requirements for export health certificates for products of animal origin and animal byproducts. The requirement for phytosanitary certificates will be extended to all regulated plants and plant products and not just those which are high priority. They will also be subject to physical and identity checks at border control posts. Sanitary and phytosanitary goods will also need to enter Great Britain through an appropriate border control post to enable physical checks. However, physical checks of live animals will continue at places of destination until notified otherwise. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? So what do you need to know for 1st January? All sanitary and phytosanitary goods will need to be pre-notified using the IT system IPAFs. It is the responsibility of your importer in Great Britain to submit a pre-notification on IPAFs. In order to submit a notification, they will need the following information. The product being imported, the date that the product will be imported, which country the imported product is coming from, and the place of destination for the consignment. To access IPAFs, the importer will need to create a government gateway ID via gov.uk. The first person to register an organisation will become the administrative owner. In order to raise a notification, you will need to have a UK based entity that can be detailed on the application and is responsible for the consignment. You may need to employ an import agent to do so. Any notification raised on IPAFs must be raised by the person responsible for the load. Um, if we go on to the next slide, I can talk you through export health certificates. Um, <clears throat> so export health certificates will be required from July 2022. It is the EU exporter's responsibility to obtain the export health certificate, which will be issued to you by the competent authority in the country from which you are exporting from. A certifying officer authorised by the competent authority must complete the official certificate. So this could be an official veterinarian or official inspector as defined by the relevant EU retained legislation. The EU exporter must send an electronic copy of the health certificate to their importer in Great Britain. The original must be presented with the goods to the border control post. Your importer in Great Britain must upload the electronic copy of the certificate to IPAFs as part of the pre-notification process. Any official sanitary and phytosanitary documents that are required to accompany the health certificate will be specified on the relevant health certificate. Other documentation may be required depending on the commodity, such as a catch certificate for marine caught fish. Model health certificates are available on gov.uk and you can use these to check the specific requirements for your commodity. I must stress that these are examples of the certificates. The real certificates will be issued by the relevant competent authority in your country. There are more details about how these certificates are filled in on the link at the bottom of the slide. Um, if you cannot identify an appropriate health certificate, you should speak with your importer in Great Britain and check gov.uk for an import license. If there is no import license available, you will need to complete an IV58 form and send it to the Animal and Plant Health Agency. There are links available on this slide for further information, so please do look through these. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, so from 1st July 2022, phytosanitary certificates will be required for all regulated plants and plant products. A phytosanitary certificate is a statement from the Plant Health Authority that the consignment has been officially inspected, that it complies with the legal requirements for entry into Great Britain, and that is free from quarantine pests and diseases. The phytosanitary certificate will need to be obtained from the Plant Health Authority in the country where the supplier is based. 
the inspection for the fire to sanitary certificate must take place no more than 14 days before the consignment is dispatched and someone in the inspecting plant health authority must sign the phytosanitary certificate within the same 14 day period. You'll need to upload a copy of the phytosanitary certificate on the import IT system Peach if you need to pre-notify your consignment. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so we tend to get a lot of questions from businesses about composite products, so I'll cover this briefly for you. To clarify what I mean by composite product, these are food products that are intended for human consumption only. They contain a mix of processed products of animal origin and plant products used as a main ingredient, not just added for flavouring or processing. To give you a few examples, that could include a ready lasagna, pork pies or mayonnaise if it contains more than 50% egg. Composite products must follow the stage requirements for products of animal origin. So they will require pre-notification from 1st January 2022 and from 1st July they will require health certification and to arrive at a border control post. However, there are a few exemptions. Goods are exempt if they contain less than 50% processed animal product no meat product and they meet the requirements set out in legislation outlined on this slide. If your goods contain any meat product or more than 50% animal product, it must be pre-notified using IPAFs. It must be accompanied by an export health certificate and follow the phased approach set out for products of animal origin. If you're not sure if this applies to your product, there is detailed guidance including a composite product decision tree available on the animal imports file sharing link, which you will find at the end of the presentation. Can we go to the next slide, please? From July 2022, the process for pre-notifying sanitary and phytosanitary goods on IPAFs will change. From July, a common health entry document, also known as a CHED, will be required, which means that further information will need to be entered as part of the notification. The required information is laid out on this slide for you, but this includes information such as the country of import, the product, reason for import and transportation details. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please, Kathleen, um, there is a process map for the SPS process from 1st July. Uh, so please do look at this in further detail once the slides have been sent out. Can we move to the next slide, please? So moving on, there are some changes being implemented for products transiting through Great Britain. From January 2022, animal products transiting through Great Britain will need to be pre-notified on IPAFs before entry. Before the goods leave the country, they will need to be notified to authorities. Plant and plant products will need to be accompanied with a signed declaration stating that the goods are under phytosanitary transit. There is no requirement to pre-notify these goods. From July 2022, consignments transiting through Great Britain will require an export health certificate and must enter and exit through a point of entry with an appropriately designed border control post. Can we move to the next slide, please? So the next issue I will touch upon is groupage. By this, I mean the commercial grouping of multiple consignments within a single sealed trailer or container. 
there are four models that have been developed for importing grouping loads from the European Union into Great Britain. These include the consolidation hub method, whereby different consignments are brought together at a single approved premise. The certification takes place for all individual consignments by the certifying officer. Grouped consignments are loaded and sealed before they leave for onward destination. The second is a sequential or single model which facilitates pickups from multiple sites. Certification takes place at each site. A seal is applied to the overall load at each pickup point, removed and replaced at the next pickup. This method is reliant upon a certificate of non-manipulation. There is also the linear or multiple pallet model, which is designed to facilitate pickups from multiple sites with certification at each collection point in the chain. This requires pallet level sealing. Sealed pallets are added to the means of transport and the individual seal number on the pallet recorded on the export health certificate. There is no requirement for a certificate of non-manipulation with this model, but it does require the presence of a certifying officer at each collection point. All models may be used in conjunction with each other as long as general principles around sealing and certification remain. For example, traders may wish to blend the linear model with the consolidation hub method. The key with the mixed hybrid approach will be ensuring full traceability of all products entering Great Britain. We will be sending out links with further information once these have been updated to reflect recent changes. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So I will now talk to you about marketing standards in more detail. Marketing standards will differ according to the product you are exporting. So please do visit the links provided for detailed guidance. From July 1st, all hops imports from third countries, this is EU and non-EU countries, will require a GB attestation of equivalence issued by an authorised agency from the country of origin. Until 30th June 2022, imported hops and hop products must be accompanied by one of the following documents an EU attestation of equivalence issued by an authorised agency or an EU certificate from EU member states only issued by an approved certification centre. With regards to wine, the UK is taking steps to remove this requirement of VI1 certification for wine imports. We have started the legislative process for the removal of VI1 certificates we are aiming to implement legislation to remove this by before the end of the year. However, our timeline for implementation is dependent on parliamentary consent and approval. And lastly, with poultry meat, EU poultry meat with optional indications for farming or chilling methods or both will need a third country listing or an EU competent authority certificate. If we move on to the next slide, please. So you may also need to be aware of upcoming controls for organic product and food labelling. From 1st July 2022, organic products imported from the EU to Great Britain will require a certificate of inspection. You will need to use the interim manual GB organic import system to do so. If we can go to the next slide, please. And lastly, in terms of food labelling, you have a little longer to make the necessary changes. For any pre-packed food placed onto the UK market after 31st September 2022, a UK-based food business operator or UK importer address on the food will be required. Labelling rules apply once the food is placed on the market rather than when it's imported. Therefore, food information may be corrected following import, but before the food is placed on the market in the UK. 
Overstickering is an acceptable method of correcting information, but an oversticker must not obscure or cover mandatory information, for example, the date mark or the lot mark. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this include, concludes my presentation today. Many thanks for your attention. And um, there are lots of links on the slide for further guidance. So please do look through these if you have um, any further questions. Um, please also put your questions in the chat for my colleagues and I will now pass you back uh, for the rest of the presentations today. Thank you very much. So as I said, please keep asking your questions in the Q&A chat bar. Um, I can see that lots of different questions are coming in and our presenters are answering those. So thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to pass over to another BPDG colleague, John Winterburn, um, who's going to talk through uh, Kent and the Short Straits. So John, if you're able to come online, then we will we will do that presentation, please. Thanks, Natasha. Can you hear me OK? We can, yes, thank you. Excellent. Morning, everyone. Um, so as Natasha said, my name is John Winterburn. I work within the UK Board and Put called Deliver Group in the Contingency and Locations team. Um, this morning, I'm just going to spend a few moments just going through some of the details in regards to our inland border facilities. So can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So focusing on Kent to start with, the inland border facilities in, in and around the Kent area. So we have the Epsley, Sevington, Dover, Dover Western Docks and Stop 24. Uh, this morning I'm going to particularly focus on Sevington, but mention will be given to the Dover facilities as well. Next slide, please. So it's important to note as well, there are other um, inland border facilities around the UK. So there's a uh, site in Warrington, North West, Holyhead, just in Wales, Birmingham and North Weald as well. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, I'm going to focus on Sevington to start with. So from January 2022, all Kent Shore Straits traffic requiring checks will be directed to Sevington. After the full inbound checks come into effect, traffic will continue to go to Sevington. And as the Dover sites, which I'm going to speak about in a moment, go live, they'll be become available as well. So some of the checks that are going to be completed at Sevington include CITES checks, ATA carnets, traffic management, Office of Destination and Office of Transit compliance checks, as well as border readiness checks. Stays at the site in Sevington are limited to two hours. And an IBF app is available for drivers that have smartphones. This will help get them processed on site as quickly as possible. They can also use the service to tell HMRC in advance that they're attending an inland border facility because the goods that they're moving are either going to an office of departure or office of destination, are covered by an ATA carnet or need to cite his permit as already mentioned. Next slide, please. Thank you. So some of the departments that are currently on site at Sevington include HMRC and Border Force. They'll be later joined by colleagues from DEFRA, DVSA, as well as the Port Health Authority as well. So currently the capacity at Sevington is just over 1,095. However, the site is evolving with changing requirements, therefore that actual number may not be realised. Currently in, within the IBF, there's 550 holding spaces, 300 contingency freight management spaces and 245 spaces in swim lanes. Now it's important to note that should Sevington be closed for any reason, drivers will be advised of the closure and be redirected to another available site. And as mentioned earlier, these sites include sites including Ebbsfleet, Northfield, Warrington and Birmingham. Next slide, please. Thank you. So finally, just to touch on the other future sites for Kent. Um, so there will be a Dover inland border facility. That's a further HMRC site that's been developed at Dover with the aim of coming online for the end of 2022. This site will act as a location for both inbound and outbound transit of goods to and from the UK. And it will also provide a facility for customs checks that can be implemented 
24-7, 365 days per year. There is an additional DEFRA site which has been developed for the POAO checks. Further details aren't currently available as that is currently at the commercially sensitive stage. And finally, there is an additional DEFRA site which has been considered for small animal checks. Again, this is in the early stages and more information will be provided closer to completion on that site. That is the end of my slides for this morning. Thank you for listening and I'll hand you back to Natasha. Thank you. Um, we're now going to hear from Bayes. Um, so I think my colleague Claire is on the line to talk through the UK CA marking. I am Natasha and can you hear me okay? I can, yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, so as Natasha says, I am, my name is Claire McKee and I'm from the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial um, Strategy. And I'm going to talk a bit uh, today about the UK CA mark. And to briefly introduce uh, the UK CA mark, it is the conformity assessment mark for the new um, UK's regulatory regime. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the timeline for UKCA is uh, set out here in the slide. So I'll talk I'll talk you through that. And um, essentially the, the UKCA mark, it can be used um, as of now. Um, in some cases for some goods, you do need to be using it, use it now. And until the 31st of December 2022, you can continue to use CE marked goods um, and, and put those on the GB um, markets whilst you're um, preparing to use UKCA and uh, build that into your product lines. From the 1st of January 2023, you must use uh, UKCA marking when placing most manufactured goods on the GB market. Um, it is specific to, to product legislation, so do double check. Um, which legislation your, your goods fall under as that will dictate when you need to implement the, the UKCA if you need to implement it sir. Until the 31st of December 2023 you can still use uh, you can still apply the UKCA marking via a, a sticky label or an accompanying document um, and, and again there are some exceptions to this and they are listed on gov.uk um, this is a, a, a measure to kind of uh, help businesses prepare and kind of uh, again make the transition to the UKCA mark as smooth as possible for businesses. And then from the 1st of January 2024, the UKCA marking must be applied directly to the product unless, of course, the legislation says otherwise, and um, it must be inbuilt into the product design. Next slide, please. Um, so to, to gauge um, an idea of whether or not you need the UKCA marking for your product, um, as a, a kind of uh, easy way to tell, um, if your good requires CA marking, then it is likely to also require uh, the UK CA marking to be sold in GB. Uh, businesses will still need to use a UK approved body if their product requires third party testing, and um, you can find all details of UK approved bodies uh, on gov.uk on a database called UK MCAP. And the responsibility of the importer to apply their address to the product by the 1st of January 2023 is still required. Um, so that, that responsibility still lies to make sure the um, address is on a company documentation on, on the importer. The requirements for placing products on the NI market are unchanged. Um, so you're still using the CE market or a combination of UK NI and CE. And again, uh, gov.uk goes into to a bit more detail on that. And you can find uh, further details on how to place goods in the NA market on, on there. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll touch briefly on rules of origin and end of easement. Uh, so until 31st of December 2021, businesses do not need suppliers declarations from suppliers in place at the time the goods are exported. They will, need, they will be needed at the point of export from 1st of January 2022 onwards. And you only need um, suppliers declarations for goods that influence the originating status of the final product. Uh, imported goods, the product specific rule allows you to use, do not require a suppliers declaration. And each consignment of goods can have a separate, separate su suppliers declaration or a long term supplier declaration can be used. And again, um, on the slide pack, there's, there's a link for uh, further guidance on that. Um, so that concludes uh, uh, my uh, small segment of today's session, so I'll hand back to Natasha. Thank you, Claire. We're now going to hand over to another BPDG colleague, Lawrence McGragan, who's going to talk through the single trade window. 
thank you very much, Natasha. And hello all. Um, as Natasha says, I'm going to talk to you uh, a brief introduction on uh, the single trade window. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So what is a single trade window? Um, the, the World Customs Organization um, sort of leads the way on e explaining uh, a single trade window. Um, it's a facility that allows parties involved in trade and transport to lodge standardized information and documents with single entry point to fulfill all import, export and transit related regulatory requirements. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the single trade window will uh, provide a way for government to interact um, and with traders at the border, acting as a single gateway um, and is part is, is an integral part of the UK's 2025 border strategy. Currently, uh, the model is that uh, the trade industry, they have to go through multiple systems across multiple different departments uh, across the UK government um, to perform any trade um, at the border across the UK, both import and export. This, of course, takes up a considerable amount of time. Um, it duplicates effort um, and uh, re reduces your capability to move trade at pace uh, across the border. The UK single trade window um, is looking to uh, enable traders and agents and intermediaries to submit um, information once through a single point um, to for your uh, import, export and transit requirements. And we'll, we will, government will take that information, um, push it through the different departments that need that information to improve our processes at the border um, and also provide uh, a more upfront um, information tool for trade. In addition, uh, as the UK single trade window is developed, it will allow users to track consignments and their uh, progress through the border journey. Um, a statement we've had previously from trade um, includes, I can track my takeaway to my front door, but I cannot track my multi-million pound consignment across the border. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows you the as is and the to be model of the single trade window. Currently, <clears throat> the model shows trade having to go through the multiple different departments for licenses, certificates, submissions of trade, VAT um, through HMRC, Home Office, DEFRA and Department of International Trade, just to name a few. The single trade window model will allow trade um, and industry to go through a single portal um, whereby a single trade window will provide that information into those other government departments, um, allowing um, two way communication, um, but allowing you, the trader, uh, to have a single point of entry. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the key features um, within the single trade window which um, I will come on to a bit more later, but uh, we are looking to build out iteratively. Uh, at the border, pre-border, there'll be a single sign-on um, for users uh, going through a single portal rather than having multiple sign-on through uh, back-end, front-end and back-end systems across government. At the border, uh, there'll be a greater visibility of goods moving across the border, both from a trader's point of view, but also for government. And then post, uh, you'll have post the border, you'll have end-to-end uh, -end supplier visibility, um, greater data, um, and therefore ability for us to identify ways to improve the service design um, and, and make sure that um, you have clear step-by-step uh, -step guidance provided to you um, where we can improve and iterate the services going forward. Um, also, we'll be looking to provide uh, data dashboards, um, open API to allow you uh, industry to sort of innovate um, and provision of data um, for uh, other government departments, namely Home Office and Border Force and DEFRA to improve our targeting regime at the border, allowing legitimate trade and freight to cross unhindered. Uh, next slide, please. So by removing duplication, 
um, increasing visibility, the single trade window will transform the border trade journey, um, adding significant efficiencies both for trade and for government. It will, as I said, it will facilitate compliant trade um, and prioritise uh, HM government resources. So allowing our already today stretched resources to focus on other priority areas um, across the departments. Single trade windows are also increasingly common across not just the UK, but across the world, um, namely Singapore, Canada, uh, already have um, embedded single trade windows of which we are looking to, um, obviously as a model, but we are looking to um, innovate a sort of much more modern trading partner with those countries. Um, and our ambition though is to have the world's most effective border. So learning from their designs, um, but creating a, a more modern single trade window. We'll be developing the single trade window over several years. Um, it will be an iterative uh, approach, um, building out the priorities uh, as we go uh, based on trader need. Um, and but it's uh, we're very keen to, to explain that it's not just about the technology itself. Um, it's much more about uh, ourselves engaging with trade industry users um, to ensure that we have the right information, the right guidance upfront. Um, depending on what it is that you are looking to uh, import or export uh, through the UK. Uh, next slide, please. So on the guidance piece, um, we have already started uh, delivery on uh, the single trade window guidance service known as check how to import or export goods. Um, this can be found on gov.uk. And it's been tailored to be as accessible and as intuitive as possible based on your uh, needs. Um, it takes you to um, specific guidance based on uh, your uh, either commodity code uh, lookup, search, um, whatever it is you're uh, you're looking to um, import or export, uh, and allows you to follow to find the most up to date guidance across um, the departments. So specifically, we're looking here at check duties and customs procedures for exporting goods, which has already been well established by the Department of International Trade. If you'd like to uh, take a have a look at uh, the Single Trade Window Guidance Service, uh, in fact, we'd encourage you to. Uh, there is a link within these slides which will be shared with you um, post this event. Um, and we'd very much like for you uh, to become more involved in shaping and designing the single trade window. Um, again, if you have interest or have any further questions outside of this, this forum, um, please feel free to uh, use the email address at the bottom of this slide uh, to make contact. And uh, we are we are keen to to work with trade throughout the journey over the next uh, next several years to develop this service. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm handing back to Natasha. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, I'm now going to go over some case studies. So we've had the presentations from government departments and I'll now spend a little bit of time going over a series of case studies um, before we move on to the Q&A session. Um, so we do have a series of case studies prepared for today's event and we actually have eight in total. Um, I appreciate that's quite a lot of information and don't worry, I won't be going over each of these eight case studies in detail, um, but we will be sharing the slides after the event. So the intention is that you can take these away and then study them at your own pace. Um, the purpose of bringing these together is to illustrate the end-to-end -end movement, EU to GB, and to show what each actor in the supply chain needs to do at various stages throughout the movement. So that's really why, we, why we're presenting these case studies today. Um, so just to quickly go over the case studies that I'll be presenting, um, the first one will be exporting auto parts from Bulgaria into Great Britain, and that's split into a January 2022 and a July 2022 movement. I will then talk through exporting tomatoes from Croatia into Great Britain, and again, that's split up into January and July of next year. 
Then the next case study is exporting fish fingers from Poland to GB. Again, that's split up into January and July. And then the final case study that I'll go through is exporting beer from the Czech Republic to Great Britain, again in January and July. Um, and that final uh, case study will show excise processes as well as transit processes. As I say, I am going to run through these quite briefly um, so that you can work through them in your own time. Um, and just to say that in each of these case studies, we have identified um, the importer, the exporter and the haulier. But we do recognise that some people will be using an agent for parts of these movements. Um, so the steps may vary slightly if you're using an agent, but we just wanted to set out really clearly what the procedures were. So if we go to the next slide. So the first case study that I will talk through is exporting auto parts from Bulgaria to GB via the short straits, and this is in January 2022. So on the next slide, we have a list of all the registrations and systems for each person in the supply chain. Um, so you'll see on that slide that we have the EURI requirements. So in this example, Damien is the EU exporter, so he needs to apply for an EU EORI number. Claire is the UK importer, so she needs a GB EORI number. And then the haulage company has both the EU and the GB EORI number so that they can use border and custom systems both in the EU and in GB. Also, if you're moving goods through a port that operates the pre-lodgement model, then the haulage firm will need to register for GVMS. You can see that in that slide, there's more information and different links to click on. Um, so again, please explore those links when we send the slides around after the event. So if we go to the next slide, so this is the first of our step by step slides and I appreciate that it's quite difficult to read. There's a lot of information on there um, and it's maybe not the, the prettiest slide uh, in the world, but it does have a lot of useful information in there and we have broken down step by step what each person needs to do in this movement. Um, again, just to say in this case, the exporter is responsible for the export and the importer is responsible for the import. Again, just to reiterate that that may change slightly um, depending on whether you're using an agent or an intermediary. So I won't do this for every slide, um, but I will just talk through sort of step by step on this movement for January, moving auto parts into GB. So as you can see, stage one is that um, Damien, so the exporter, and Claire, the importer, need to agree their terms and conditions, their INCO terms, so that the responsibility for border formalities is clear. After that's been agreed, and that should be done before the goods move, Damien then submits the export declaration. He submits the export declaration to the Bulgarian customs system and he needs to specify that Bulgaria is the country of export and that France will be the country of exit because these goods are moving via the short, short straits. Um, as it says in box three, because he submitted a combined export declaration, that already includes the safety and security information, so he doesn't need to um, submit a separate exit summary declaration. Um, once he's submitted the export accompanying document or the EAD, the export control system will allocate a movement reference number, an MRN. So Damien needs to keep note of that MRN export number. At the same time, because this movement is to a GB port or terminal that uses the pre-lodgement model, Claire is pre-lodging her import declaration and this must be done before the haulage firm moves the goods to GB. So she submits this declaration using Chief, which Claire ran through earlier, 
And this again produces another movement reference number, which she then gives to the haulage firm. So I'm now at box six on this slide. So the haulage firm then uses the goods vehicle movement service, GVMS, to input the import declaration. So they create what's called a GMR number, which stands for goods movement reference, and that links the MRN for the GV import declaration and the intended vehicle and crossing detail. So this GMR contains the MRNs for all the goods the driver is carrying. So if the driver is carrying goods um, to different destinations apart from Claire's, then that will contain the MRNs for all of those movements. So the GMR then proves that all the necessary declarations have been made as the MRNs are only generated once the declaration has been pre-lodged. The GMR is presented as part of the check-in at the border and then the vehicle and crossing detail can be updated if that's changed at all from when the declaration was uh, made. So at box seven, the haulage firm provides the driver, who we've named Joe in this example, with the movement reference numbers for the export declaration and then the goods movement reference number for the import declaration. And Joe then proceeds to the port or tunnel in France. At the port or tunnel in France, the MRN is scanned by the carrier. And when the truck embarks on the shuttle or ferry, the export is discharged by the carrier's IT system, which communicates with the French customs system. And there's a link on the slide there in box eight to further guidance on French procedures and systems. So moving on to box number nine, Joe also provides the import GMR to the carrier at check-in and the carrier systems link in with HMRC systems in order to check at the point of check-in that the GMR is valid. Um, and what that basically means is to check that the declaration has been lodged and the driver won't be able to board if the GMR is not valid. So then moving over onto the other side of the page at box number 10, when the truck embarks on the shuttle or ferry, the export accompanying document is discharged and the Office of Exit in France notifies the Office of Export in Bulgaria via the Export Control Service that the goods have left the EU. So at the same time, the GMR is checked remotely and if the goods require inspection, GVMS will return a held status and that message is then communicated to the driver. So if the goods do require an inspection, the driver will need to go to an inland border facility or IBF for the checks to take place. In this example, the consignment isn't selected for a control and Joe drives to Claire's warehouse. So now we're looking at box 13 and Claire has received the consignment so she can now make any updates to Chief that are needed. So for example, the time of import um, if that changes compared to the information she previously submitted. This declaration must be updated to arrived by the end of the next working day. And in box 14, you can see that prior to import, Claire checked and confirmed that this is a zero tariff journey, so she doesn't need to pay any tariffs on this consignment. As the goods are subject to 20% VAT, Claire is VAT registered and she can use postponed VAT accounting to account for the import VAT and this is then paid quarterly. Claire has also registered for a duty deferment account, which means that if she imports goods regularly, she can make one payment a month through direct debit instead of paying for individual consignments. So that's the walk through the first case study. And as I say, I don't intend to do that for all eight of the case studies, um, but hopefully that was helpful. So if we move on to the next slide. So the second case study in your pack is the same example, exporting auto parts from Bulgaria to GB by the short straits. But in this example, it's July 2022. So on the registrations page, you will see that in addition to the registrations mentioned previously, the haulier also needs to register for SNSGB. 
and that's so that they can make the entry summary declaration which will be required from the 1st of July 2022. So on the next slide, which again is the step-by-step -step walkthrough, we've highlighted where there are differences and this, uh, in this case, the difference is that the entry summary declar declaration needs to be submitted. So that's highlighted in the boxes there for you. So if we move on to the next case study. So what we're looking at now is exporting tomatoes from Croatia to GB via the short straits. And again, we've moved back to January 2022. So these uh, next set of case studies go through the requirements for exporting and importing fruit and veg. So if you look at the registrations page, um, again we've highlighted where there are differences from that first case study and you can see that Claire will need to register for Peach online system and she will also need to register for IPAS. So this is the UK importer who's registering for these systems. And again, there's further links on those pages, which will take you to, to more detail. Just to flag as well, in the grey box on the left hand side, EU based businesses cannot register for IPAFs. So you'll need to be established in the UK or use a UK based representative to register for IPAFs, as this notification must be raised by a UK based entity. So just to, to flag that to you. So moving on to the step by step. Again, we've highlighted on this slide where there are SPS specific requirements. So in January 2022, um, you will need to pre notify the import and then if checks are needed uh, for the consignment, these will take place at the place of destination. So this is the, the January 2022 case study. So if we move on, we also have an example of the same movement in July. So moving on, uh, again, we've got the IPAS and Peach registration listed there, and also the Haulia will need to register for SNSGB as in the previous case study. So on the step by step, Again, we've highlighted where there are specific requirements for this movement. Um, so the exporter will need to apply for a phytosanitary certificate and send this to the importer. Um, and the importer will then upload this to IPAFs. You will also need to make sure that your goods enter uh, GB via an appropriate border control post. And again, there's further detail on that slide and links there. So the next case study um, is exporting fish fingers from Poland to GB via the short straits. Um, we also did one of these industry days uh, for Poland specifically. So if you dialed into that, you might recognize this case study. Um, so if we move on to registrations, again, uh, the IPAS registration is required. And then on the step by step, um, so as this is a, a fish case study, we've outlined, outlined the requirements on processing statements and catch certificates. So all that detail is in there um, and it shows the layers of those procedures alongside customs requirements. Um, so again, in January 2022, this will require pre-notification IPAFs. Um, I won't dwell too long on that, but the information is there for you to go over yourself. So case study six then shows the July requirements for uh, fish fingers from Poland to GB. Um, so again, the registrations now include registering for SNS GB and on the step by step, the additional requirements for July will include the need for an export health certificate um, you will need to enter GB via a BCP and there will also be a requirement for entry summary declarations. Um, so this case study actually runs onto two slides. So again, I will leave you to browse that at your own leisure. 
So now the final case study, um, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know before we move on to the Q&A session, is exporting beer from the Czech Republic to Great Britain via the short straits. And this example uses transit. Um, so we've uh, built in the transit requirements to this case study and also shown the excise requirements. So on the registration slide, you'll see that for January 2022, in addition to the, the sort of the usual registrations, um, the haulage firm needs to register for NCTS, the new computerised transit system, and that's in order to be able to do the, the transit declarations. So if we go on to the step by step slide, Again, I don't, I don't intend to read this one out, um, but just to let you know that this does go through all the different transit elements, which will include the Office of Departure Procedure, the Office of Transit Procedure, and the Office of Destination Procedure. And it also outlines the requirement to have the paper transit accompanying document or the TAD, um, that needs to travel with the goods. So you need the, the physical paper copy of that document when you use transit. And again, we have split this up. So the next slide, um, this shows the same case study. So beer from the Czech Republic, but in July 2022. And you'll see that the difference is that um, the haulage company has to register for SNSGB and on the following slide we've highlighted where the entry summary declaration is required. So if we move on now, that is the end of the case study session and as I say I hope you found those useful. Um, we will be circulating the slides after the session. I appreciate I've gone through quite a lot of information quite quickly there, um, but hopefully those case studies will be a useful, a useful resource uh, for you and uh, all the actors in the supply chain to go through um, and look at step by step. So I'm now going to move on to the Q&A session um, and I can see that we've had quite a few questions today. We will try to go through all of them. Um, and I can see that uh, my colleagues have been answering them in the chat as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think what I will start with was there was a question that came in quite early on about GVMS. So there were quite a few questions on GVMS. So I wonder HMRC if we start with those and I think there were a couple of questions, one about whether there would be a GVMS training manual and whether it would be possible to test GVMS before January. So I don't know whether someone would be able to come online and, and talk a little bit more about GVMS and, and what HMRC are doing in that space. Hi Tasha, it's Claire, of course. Um, we know people are interested in GVMS, that's fantastic. We definitely like to encourage uh, hauliers to sign up for GVMS, register for GVMS well ahead of January the 1st. There are um, several points of information on gov.uk on how to register and there's some support uh, as you go through that process uh, during the registration. And there's also some other pages on gov.uk to assist learning. Um, there is a lot more information coming out and we are, I'm afraid you're going to get bombarded uh, for EU hauliers, a social media uh, strategy has started uh, last week um, and there will be leaflets available. So there'll be everything from social media will be tweeting but we'll also be handing out uh, leaflets I think those are in around 10 different languages so there's lots of places to get information but we would encourage uh, actual registration of the service so you can start familiarizing yourself with what it looks like. Thanks Claire and then there were a, a couple of sort of more specific questions on GBMS there was one that I saw that you'd gone back on on two factor authentication and um, so I don't know whether you can you can chat a little bit about that 
and then also a question saying can we register for GBMS on behalf of a carrier and validate the MRN instead of them and um, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about intermediaries and GBMS. Thank you. So yeah, unfortunately, the two factor authentication is required because uh, the GVMS system sits on the government gateway. So that is a requirement in order to use the service, but really appreciate the feedback that we've had here today uh, from attendees and we will take that back to HMRC colleagues. Um, in terms of uh, whether you can register for GVMS and use it on behalf of a haulier, um, absolutely, yes, you can do that. Um, in fact, we anticipate that uh, a lot of people will be doing this in the back office for a haulier who is actually driving the goods. And again, the gov.uk points of information that we've provided do give you some more information about who can access um, and why. And just to say, that uh, that doesn't make you liable for the import declaration. So just to confirm that registration for GVMS and use of GVMS does not make you liable for the actual customs import declarations. Thanks, Claire. Um, I'll move on now to EORI numbers. Um, we had a question that said, can a GB company get an EU EORI number for delivery to the Republic of Ireland? So I just wondered whether you could talk a little bit about EU traders and hauliers applying for GB EORIs and, and in what circumstances they might need that GB EORI number. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so you can apply for um, an EU EORI number um, and you should do so within the first country that you are landing those goods. And then that EU EORI number is valid uh, for movements right across the EU. Um, and you can find out more information uh, on EU uh, sort of websites and uh, points of interest than you can on gov.uk. But gov.uk is very clean on the uh, clear, sorry, on the GB EORI. And I think this is worth emphasising because we have had some questions at other events on this as well. Um, so, you know, you can apply for a GB EORI um, even if you're not uh, UK established. And you will need that GB EORI if you're making any kind of customs declaration in, in the UK. If you're making an entry summary declaration or an exit summary declaration, if you're making a temporary storage declaration or making a customs declaration for temporary admission, for all of those reasons you'll need a GB EORI. Um, but also as well as that, if you're acting as a carrier for transporting goods by sea, inland waterway or air, if you're acting as a carrier connected to the custom system and you want to get notifications regarding the lodging or amendment of those entry summary declarations. And also, if you're established in a common transit country where the declaration is lodged instead of an entry summary declaration or is used as a pre departure declaration. So there are lots of reasons that you may need a GB EORI, even if you are an EU trader or haulier. And you can do that at HTTPS. Uh, sorry, I'll just give you the gov.uk address. It's at www.gov.uk slash forward slash EORI, and that's all lowercase. And you can do that online, and it usually takes around 10 minutes. The maximum it will take is around five days if we need to make any checks. So hopefully that's helpful for people thinking about those pesky EORIs, Natasha. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. That was really helpful. And again, that gov.uk link that you just mentioned, gov.uk slash EORI, um, we will be sort of publishing those links as part of the slides that we will send to everyone after this event. So if you just miss the, the gov.uk links that our presenters are talking about, they will all be included in that pack, which you will receive this afternoon. Um, and sort of on that note, there was a question saying, could you issue guides explaining clearly and easily uh, for hauliers how how we will operate between EU and GB from the 1st of January? Um, so I think one of your colleagues, Claire, came back and, and sent the link to the hauliers handbook, um, which I think would be a good place to start on that question. Um, but just to let the audience know that everything we've spoken through today, including handy links to sort of um, step by step guidance will be included in the information you will receive this afternoon. Um, I don't know whether HMRC have anything to add 
to that one. I think the Hawley's handbook probably about covers that. Um, so I'll move on to uh, packaging. Um, so there was a question about oral declarations for empty reusable containers and about hauliers refusing to, to take that on because they're afraid they'd get stuck at customs without paperwork. Um, HMRC, I don't know whether you have uh, anything to say on that, but oral declarations are permitted for empty reusable packaging at the moment. Is that right, Claire? That's absolutely right, Natasha. And the gov.uk page, sorry to keep uh, banging on about these pages, but they are useful. So the gov.uk page contains more information. And if you're moving that recyclable, reusable packaging through uh, a GVMS using port, then the haulier needs to select, it's quite easy, needs to select the by conduct or oral declaration within the creation of the GMR and that is all they need to do. So it is very straightforward and um, um, we would encourage you to look at the gov.uk pages just to have that confidence that you're able to, to carry that out. Thanks Claire. Um, so then just to move on to uh, a rules of origin question and EUR1 uh, certificates. Um, so the question was, we're exporting goods into the UK which are valued over €6,000. We have a Rex number. Do we need to issue the EUR1 origin certificate? Um, and I think one of your colleagues came back and said that uh, that certificate's not required, but I just wondered whether someone could talk that over for a minute. So that is correct, and I think it's my colleague Mike who's very capably answered that in the chat. An EUR1 is not required. The exporter needs to make a statement of origin on their commercial documents, and that's where they quote their Rex number. Um, and that can all be found in the, uh, the, the guidance that's both available on EU and UK sides. Um, and don't forget, uh, you may have a Rex number, um, but that's uh, not the case for uh, GB exporters under the rules of origin. They will only have an EORI. I think that's worth reminding people about. Thank you. And then a question that has, has just come in, what reference should the haulier put into GVMS when the importer is using CFSP EIDR? So that's Customs Freight Simplified Procedures and Entry into Declarance Record are the acronyms um, for the audience, not for you, Clara. <laughs> <laughs> we love those acronyms, Natasha. Um, so I can tell you that again, when you're creating the GMR, um, it should be the GB EORI that is used in those uh, cases for CFSP EIDR, uh, which you got spot on, Natasha. Um, and that is validated against the authorisation. So in other words, if the CFSP authorisation is valid, that is fine. If it is not, it will be flagged and the GMR will be an invalid GMR. Thank you. And sort of talking about authorisations, there was a question about solar PV modules being imported into GB. Um, but basically the question was, um, what will change on the 1st of January 2022 compared to 2021? And I think the main thing to say is that uh, you won't be able to do delayed declarations without authorisation at that point. Um, is there anything That's else? That's correct. To expand? That's on that yeah, that, that's quite correct, Natasha. And so um, importantly, that delayed declarations allowed traders up to 175 days in order to complete the supplementary declaration. So that is removed and we move to the full import authorizations or those simplified authorizations. So if you are authorized for simplified procedures, you are still able to complete um, a, an entry into declarations records or a frontier declaration and then complete the supplementary declaration. But the difference is you need to be authorized for those at the point of import rather than after the import has been done. Great, thank you. I think that brings me to the end of the customs questions uh, for now. Is there anything else you wanted to bring out at this stage, Claire, before I move on to the SPS questions for our DEFRA colleagues? Uh, no, thank you. I think we've covered a lot in the questions today and thank you to all the attendees for those really good questions. Please keep them coming in.
Great, thank you. Um, so moving on to uh, questions for, for DEFRA colleagues, I did see that a question came in, I think whilst I was going over the, the case studies, um, saying why PEACH and not IPAS from the 1st of January 2022. Um, would someone be able to, to talk that one over? I can see that there's an, an answer in the Q&A bar, but it might be useful just to go over that for the audience, please. Hi, good morning. I don't believe we have anybody from Plant Health uh, with us this morning. Um, so I found that information on the gov.uk website um, and I don't have the knowledge to talk to that in detail. OK, no but problem. My, in general, my understanding is that uh, plant products will eventually be notified on IPAVs and that it's a, a work in progress and until it actually becomes available, people need to continue to use speech. Thank you. And there's quite a comprehensive answer already in the chat. We will sort of check that through with plant colleagues and see if there's any additional information to add. But hopefully the person who asked that question has quite a lot of information there in response. Um, so just to cover off the, the other plant question that, that we had through, which was, can you please clarify if regulated or regulated and notifiable plant products require pre-notification from the 1st of January? Um, and the answer to that one, um, sort of as per the, the Q&A bar, is that just regulated and notifiable goods will require a pre-notification from the 1st of January 2022. So I hope that that covers off that question. Um, I wanted to move on to uh, uh, systems now. So there was a question saying, when will IPAFs be fully functional? Not all models are currently working. W would someone from DEFRA be able to, to speak to that one, please? Hi, it's Angela Cooper. Um, so. The, I don't think the question's quite clear enough, so I'm not too sure what the different models mean um, in the question. So I'll, I'll try and answer the best I can. Um, so for the 1st of January, the journeys um, in IPAFs are ready to go and have been ready for about six months. Um, so if you select an EU country in IPAFs, um, it will take you through to create the shortened notification process. Um, if you choose um, a rest of world country such as Australia, then it will take you through to create a CHED. So that's ready to use now. Um, so as soon as you need to start notifying from the 1st of January, it'll, the system will automatically know which notification to create. Now we are still um, building the functionality for the 1st of July and we are hoping for that to be ready to use in the training environment um, by next February. Um, but we will come out with further communications to let people know when that's ready to use. Great, thank you. And then a, another question about systems um, and about traces um, and sort of asking to confirm that the UK won't be using traces for consignments in transit. Um, and the person who asked this question said, is that even for the land bridge? Um, would someone be able to to speak to that, please. I answered the question in the chat and if any other DEFRA colleagues are in the session, um, please do pipe up also. Um, Tracer's policy is still being developed, so please do keep on looking for the latest information on gov.uk for things that relate to traces in the context of SPS and Landbridge transits. But my understanding is that the intention will be that you will have to do a pre-notification on IPAFs. Your goods will have to be, or the, the vehicle will have to be checked at the BCP. The goods will have to be sealed for the land bridge movement. Um, and we'll be using the IPAF system uh, from the 1st of July um, to manage the tracings of the goods whilst they're crossing the land bridge. OK, thank you very much for, for talking that through. Um, I've also seen that there was a question that came in 
on products of animal origin um, and saying, can you confirm if the rules from the 1st of July 2022 will apply to PA, uh, POAO only under safeguard measures. Um, so I think if if one of our Jeffra colleagues could come on the line because uh, those uh, requirements from the 1st of July will apply to all products of animal origin. Um, so could someone chat that through, please? Yes, um, and apologies. I'm slightly short of breath of COVID infection just now. Um, the the requirement will be for all POAOs um, to require EHCs and possible be selected for BCP checks from the 1st of July. Uh, once again, um, further information on this particular scenario will become available over time um, and people must please keep keep looking for new information on in this space. But uh, it will certainly be the case that it's not just good subject to safeguard measures, but all POAOs that will be subject to controls from 1st of July in terms of both certification and selection for BCP checks. Thank you. And and sort of while I've got you on the line, I saw that you you answered another question uh, in the chat, and this one was about export health certificates, um, and saying will the EHC be applicable applicable for a product if the product is for human purpose, but also for animals purpose. Um, so I think the questioner was asking. Uh, would you need two different health certificates for the different purposes? Um, so you did answer that in the chat. I just wondered whether you could go over that as part of this session, please. Yeah, this one probably bears a bit more of a discussion, um, which is not so easy to do in the chat. Um, by and large, the rule of thumb and the principle is that if the goods are produced as products intended for human consumption, you need to use the appropriate certificates that cover the human health as well as the animal health aspects of those goods. If you produce those goods in a premises which produces products intended for human consumption, but at the point of export, you then decide it is not required for human consumption, then you would technically have to then export that good under the ABP product because ABP controls take over at the point where a product is no longer intended for human consumption. So all products that are not intended for human consumption, um, not all products, all products of animal origin or animal products, um, at the point where they're not intended for human consumption will be either ABP or germinal products and will have to be then exported under the respective appropriate certificates. However, if you export a batch which is intended for human consumption, but your receiver in GB decides to take part of that batch and divert it for a purpose that is not for human consumption, then the whole batch can be exported as fit for human consumption and the, uh, the part of the batch after arrival in GB uh, may then be repurposed or designated for an alternative use in the animal feed chain, for example. Great, thank you very much for going over that. That's that's quite a complicated one, so I appreciate your your answer on that one. Um, I think there were a couple of questions on infrastructure um, that I'll just go over quickly. Um, so there was one about where POAO checks would be undertaken for goods coming through the short straits. Um, and so the answer given was that from January 2022, um, all short stra straights traffic requiring checks will be directed to Sevington. Um, and then as the, the Dover sites go live, they will also become available. So that answer is in the chat. And also someone asked for a link to the HMRC inland border facilities application. Um, and I can see that that has been shared as well. And we'll make sure that that's shared as part of the Q&A document that we send out after the event as well. Um, I don't know whether there's anything further that um, any of our presenters would like to talk through or, or emphasise today before we wrap up the session. 
But I think that's been quite a comprehensive Q&A session. So thank you very much to all of you for, for answering those questions. OK, if there's nothing further, then if we move on to the next slide, please, Kathleen. So just to say that we do have in the pack sort of further information um, which is linked to on that slide. Um, so we mentioned the Hall Handbook earlier, so please do have a look at that. Um, I've also put the website address there um, where we have recordings of our previous events like this one and where the recording from today's event will also be uploaded. So please do make use of all the information that we'll be sending to you today. So on the next slide, we do have one final question that we would like you to answer via Slido um, before the end of today's event. Um, so this is just a, a feedback question, really. So following the webinar, I understand what I need to do to move goods between the EU and GB. And once you've answered that yes, no question, there is an opportunity to provide further feedback. So please do so. Um, again, you can use the QR code, the hashtag BPDG, or the link that I posted earlier. Um, so on the next slide, that brings us to the end of today's event. So as I said, we'll be circula circulating the slides shortly, so they should be with you this afternoon. Um, we will also be putting the recording on scuv.uk and once we have the link to that recording, we will share that with everyone who has registered. And again, please do sort of share that across your businesses and associations uh, for anyone who might find that useful. Um, and we will also be looking at all the Q&A that we had today um, and we'll be compiling that into a document that we will share with you all. So thank you very much for dialing into today's session um, and we will say goodbye now. Thank you.